Um, hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, this is uh, Nico, and uh, this is our first talk of the year and of the fall. Uh, my name is Hao Chi. I'm a professor in computer science and design here at Northwestern. And uh, yeah, it's just a great pleasure to be introducing uh, Julio today for the first Nico seminar. Um, I do want to just let people know before I introduce Julio that this is the first of many seminars. Um, these will be every Wednesday at noon until I'm told uh, November 16th for this quarter. Um, and I'll continue after that as well um, in future quarters. Um, there is also food, um, but food will be available at the end. So you could just grab food to go. You know, we don't have to worry about uh, eating and listening at the same time, OK? Um, but yeah, without further ado, I just want to introduce uh, uh, Dean Julio Ortino. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be introducing Julio, um, who I think, you know, having been a faculty here for, I don't know, eight plus years, um, it was always good to have a dean who cared about uh, interdisciplinarity uh, at an engineering school, no less. Um, so I think one of the things that I've really been inspired by with Julio is just how he's such a broad thinker and always arguing for the integration of our knowledge across areas and thinking about the whole complex system as opposed to just thinking only about the pieces and parts. Um, so today, Julio's here to talk to us about his new book uh, with Bruce Mao called The Nexus, um, where he'll talk to us about the convergence of art, technology, and science. So without further ado, I welcome Dean Ortino. Well, thank you, Hochi. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about this book. Normally, in talks like this, I talk about the contents of the book. In here, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the book was constructed. So. It's an unusual book, um, right off the bat in the cover, books have one subtitle, here there are two, but it's about the augmentation of thinking spaces, the new convergence of the thinking spaces coming from art, technology and science, and then how the implementation of ideas that may emerge from that converging space can become reality, which is the the augmented thinking for a complex world. And that part I'm going to touch with one or two slides only. So the, the motivation for the book, you can make your own list. There are lots of big problems facing society now. Uh, you could even cluster them in classes, but the, the list is really extensive. We could do a survey here, you'll come up with many more besides that the wave of innovations are becoming shorter and the environment is changing and this is sustainability is kind of I mean, more important than ever. And the very concept of work is being redefined and that everything is connected. And out, out of this list, you could extract, I don't know, three things that have to do with connectivity. 25 years ago, we thought if we were connected, everything will be better. We couldn't understand the consequences of that. And now we are seeing why there are downsides to this. So the, the manifesto of the book is what you see there, that today more urgently than ever, we need to augment the thinking. Uh, the, the demands are clear. We must adopt new ways that cut across classical boundaries. So basically, those are the things. Uh, new ways of thinking, augmentation of thinking spaces, and mastering complexity. Okay. So within the book, uh, you are going to find lots of things uh, in the table of contents. And I'm going to even talk about that. You are going to find out that the book is about leadership, innovation, creativity, art, complexity, science, technology, the kind of how big the the lettering is in there, demands uh, is a reflection on how much play things get in there. Uh, the Renaissance, there are lots of things about the Renaissance, creative organizations, the adjacent possible, which may be known to many people here, emergence, also known to many people here, um, longevity, creativity, uh, intersections, universities, a whole bunch, complementarity also gets playing here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Even architecture, network science, there are a part on that. Tons of things. Uh, mathematics, uh, because 
there's nothing more creative than math and engineering. physics, engineering, and predictions, and a whole bunch of things. So I'm going to touch on many of these things, including education. The book touches on those. And I have in here five posters you can grab. There are only a few of these. I'm going to this, this figure in here, you will see it in the talk, OK? Uh, but there is another figure which is important in the book, which is one about the brain thinking, right brain thinking, and design. Uh, in fact, the only thing that you are going to hear in this talk is from that figure about art, technology, and science, how they kind of how they grow. But as I said, I'm going to tell you more about how the book came about. Okay? So I was one of the few people who benefited from the pandemic. Okay? In 2006, Bruce Mao, who is one of the most famous designers in the world working now, had a show that took over the entire Museum of Contemporary Art. This was one of the rooms, and this was another one. And Bruce now, uh, this is a film. Um, I think you can watch the trailer in YouTube. And I said I need to meet him. And then I was elated when he moved from Canada to the States. And there were editorials in the Toronto Star on how bad it was that Bruce Mao was leaving Canada. And then I heard that he was moving to Chicago. And I was elated about that. And then I discovered that he actually had moved almost across my home. So the book is a result of 12 years of coffees, discussing ideas, and maybe two years of Zoom calls. But the pandemic is what allowed me what lots of free weekends. Uh, I couldn't have blocks of time given my work, and I push it. And at some moment, I had enough that I could approach publishers. And the, the really interesting thing about approaching publishers, you have books which are only text, most of the books that you see. And then there are books that are mostly images, the ones from Taschen, Python, architecture books, art books. And normally the, the people from, uh, help you promote the book, they said, send me a chapter. And this was very hard to send the chapter. But there were two people who understood. And MIT that worked with Random House and Penguin Press, they, three people who I, I wish I know who they were, they got it. And that's what allowed the book to proceed. So the book is about deep down leadership and innovation. In fact, in Amazon, one of the, I have no idea how the algorithms work. One is business decision making appears in. So, but the two main issues are the ones that you see in the title. They are the augmentation of thinking and complexity. So, at the very root of this is thinking modes and basically understanding how other people think. Okay? There are lots of misconceptions. Artists tend to think that people in science and engineering are very rational machines, cold, dispassionate. They don't understand the passions that drive people. And at the same time, we tend to equate art with creation, inspiration, and it's not like that. Okay? There is much more process in art that people think. And there are many, many stretches of times in which people are not inspired. Okay? So, but let me start by, by showing this. This is evolution of a technology. This is a birth, rapid growth plateau. By, by the way, in many areas of science, you can have the same kind of thing. But let me use this just to get to the comparison between art technology. So 
If I show you anything in technology, okay, these are modes to store information. Um, wheels, and brushes, and papyrus, and paper, and typewriters, and eventually the cloud. If I show you these, and even if you were coming from outer space, and you can ask questions, you will be able to tell me which came first, second, put them some arrow time. Okay? Although you have to understand that progression is not progress. Okay? Just because a technology came second doesn't mean that that represents progress by whatever definition you have. Uh, sometimes there are clear bifurcations. So, for example, these, the real Harley Davidson machines are north of here in Milwaukee. There is the Harley Davidson Museum. And at some moment between 1912 and 1913, there was this quantum jump in which Harley Davidson went from one cylinder to two, and they stuck with two until now. And from a leather belt to a chain belt. Okay? So technology has these jumps. There are also jumps in science. And, but as with science, sometimes there are changes that whatever you knew about the previous mode of thinking, let's say Charlie Davidson had a lot of accumulated knowledge on how to even tune the sound of the engines, because Charlie Davidson is is more than selling a bike to ride, they sell emotion. But at some moment you go to this and whatever experience you had about internal combustion engines doesn't help you when you go to eBay. Okay? So we are talking about thinking modes. And one thing that I will use as a backdrop is visual art. Uh, why visual art? Well, one is because I feel comfortable with that, okay? But also in visual art, we tend to equate the end result with, wow, the creative thing. But in, in fact, more than in anything else, more than in science, you see the evolution of the idea. The trail survives. Every piece of paper that Picasso painted, it's out there. And you can order, that's the job of a curator, is to put these pieces in order maybe compare him with Brack or someone else in the parallel on how they were thinking. So these are sketches, and there are 43 that we know of, uh, because Picasso was with um, Dora Mar, I think was the mistress at the point. She took all photographs, and eventually this resulted in the famous Guernica that is in the Reina Sofia in Madrid, it used to be at the MoMA, but didn't appear out of thin air. He did lots of sketches playing with location of images, concepts, until Picasso was happy with the end point. But behind each of these paintings, there is probably an evolution. In here you see a Hockney, uh, the oldest, but if I ask you, first of all, if I ask you, please put this in the right chronological order. I do not know how many of you can do it. Okay. By the way, this is the oldest, Kandinsky. Basquiat, top left, is the newest. And even if I ask you, they, there are two paintings produced by the same artist you will have a tough time. In the book, we give the answer and it's upside down. And this and that one, they were done by Gerald Richter. And, but it's not like Richter one day painted Betty, which is his painting, and the next day the other one. There's an evolution, but if I show you all the final result, it looks completely unexpected. So the, the thinking, in here, in art, is that these are all in between 1910 and what, 1988, 
the concept of progress in modern art, which is what I'm talking about, is hard to define. Uh, even if I show you something that has a little bit more of technology, because in the previous things they were either oils or maybe acrylics, just that's not enough to put them in order. Okay? Uh, although our historians and curators will look at the pigments to determine uh, something was a fake, but we're not talking about this. We're talking about the, the end concept of what resulted from the thinking of the artist. There is more technology in chairs, and you could ask, some of them may have plastic, and, and that obviously couldn't be before enchanted. But even if I ask you to put this in order, that will be a tough thing to do. Okay? So the, the point is that a technology evolves like this, and technologies don't run completely their course before they are replaced by another technology. So a succession of technologies will be like that. And sometimes they could be closely kind of linked to each other. Eventually, we'll get that something like that, in which the straight line represents evolution, progress, the squiggly line, some kind of paradigm shift, evolution, if you want. And if I ask someone to represent how the evolution of art is now in the 20th, 21st century, the figure that will emerge is kind of like that. So that's the one that I mentioned is in the post, art, technology, and science. And by whatever measure you pick, and I'll get into that in a second, technology is always in between art and science. So evolution in art, hard to define. Uh, and here I'm quoting Peter Scaldal, his favorite author of mine. He's the art critic for The New Yorker. She just wrote a piece on Piet Mondrian, the Dutch artist. I, I did, he doesn't say this in the article. Mondrian doesn't sound like a Dutch name until you learn that he eliminated an A in Mondrian. So it was Mondrian with two A's, and he took one out, and looks more French than Dutch, but he was Dutch. So he said the modern, postmodern, and postmodern uh, periods may have been the last recognizable ones, and after that has been one dumb thing after another one. And that's why I'm using this as the most chaotic evolution as a backdrop for this discussion. So that's what I mentioned before. So, in, so there are different thinking modes in here. And if we want to do some sort of big binary divisions in between the thinking modes, the brain is more complicated than this, but we can put things that represent what you would call left brain thinking skills, analytical, rational, logical, and right brain thinking skills, which will be more metaphorical, creative, if you want, divergent as opposed to convergent. So you have elements of both, but Clearly, the thinking that goes more on the side of artistic thinking will be there. The more in science will be here. Technology will be borrowing from those. And the next of thinking is that you will borrow from those, and you will have more than one lens. You have different ways to look at the world. And the more the broader space you have, the more the possibility of hitting a good idea. Linus Pauling said, and I completely agree, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas. Okay? There is a problem with having lots of ideas because the ideas coming from the thinking in here and the thinking in there may kind of be opposite to each other. And I'll get more into it. So the, the whole point in here, the, what I'm, the plea that I'm making in here, is that if you really want to benefit by how other people look at things. You have to go beyond equating artists with paintings 
and you know, mathematicians with theorems, and you know, electrical engineers with uh, the iPhone or IT, whatever. You have to understand how was the thinking that went into producing those things, the, the thinking mode. So, in the book I have, but I don't get much into this, uh, Trafalgar Square has four plinths, but there is one that is empty, and every two years they commission an artist to do something. And about maybe four years ago, Mike Rakovitz, who is a colleague of us, he teaches in art theory and practice, uh, got the commission. And uh, Rakovitz is he was born in the US, but his parents were Jews living in Iraq. And he is still very much attached to the things in Iraq based on what the family has been telling him. So he did this. And he did this because the real statue of this that was in Iraq was, is not in this picture, it's in this one, was systematically destroyed by ISIS. It's gone. But people knew enough about dimensions and this and that. It had the same dimensions, the actual wing bull, as the plinth in Trafalgar Square. So he, he recreated that, but he wanted to play homage to things that were in Trafalgar Square. There is a, a statue of Lord Nelson, but the bronze is with melted cannons from the war. So he wanted to kind of connect with that. But the things that most Iraqis long the most when they are abroad outside is can dates. So the whole thing, actually he imported lots of cans of dates, he emptied them, and with a can of dates is what composed this whole thing. Of course, there were sketches and a whole bunch of things in here, like here, imagining how it would look like, the elevation, how, uh, I mean, the the cladding and everything. So it's it's not like that thing appeared one instant to Rakovitz. There was a whole process. And behind every big thing in art, there is a whole structure. And the more you know about how that thing was done, the more you can appreciate. Okay. So in the book, so we made one decision about the book, and I can comment on this. We wanted a physical book. Uh, it may well be because I'm in conversations with someone that the book will evolve more into metaverse kind of concept is too early to tell. But the, the concept of the book, we wanted a physical book that was a embodiment of art, technology, and science. Just the book itself should kind of capture that. And the question was, how can we do that? And this was a result of the collaboration with Bruce. Everything was contested. There are lots of images. For every image that we pick, there were through two or three that we left out. There were only two that, uh, so you have to hire a company to get all the stuff, okay? Only two that we couldn't. One, because I learned recently that the artist himself who died, left in his will the stipulation that images could not be. You have to go and experience. It's a, a fellow named Walter de Maria. He has done things called lightning field. Are, you can go and find them in the web. He, in the middle of the Mexican, Mexican desert, he put, I don't know how many poles, stainless steel poles, and he waited patiently until there was a storm. And you see, lightning everywhere. It's a stunning photograph, but that's it. You cannot put in. So in, in, the, in the book, this is the beginning of a chapter. I'll, I'll show you this. 
it starts with a summary and then it moves like this and in fact the entire book at the top it starts with almost like an opening sequence of credits images until you hit what normally in the book comes first which is the isbn number and all of those things which in here comes like page 14. And, and you can see the text has lots of side notes in there. And so every chapter starts kind of like this. I would say most chapters would be a book in themselves if you are expanding. But the whole point in here is the deal was 220 color images, 360 pages. With that, you can decide how much content you need. Obviously, the font is really small. I can put more, but I, we push the font size as much as we can. And some people have complained that it's too small, like, for example, that. So this is one chapter. Uh, this is from Dreamscape. Uh, the chapters have, obviously, a title and then two separate lines. I'll, tell, I'll show you more, and let's see. If someone gets what the structure is in here. This is about the structures of technology and science, uh, converging domains. This is the thinking at the nexus in the complex world. And this one is lessons that cross domains. This is sculpture from a woman, Japanese artist. Uh, you could walk inside there, experience a whole bunch of things. Now, and, and then the book closes with a series of credits. Uh, by the way, that's Anish Kapoor, is the same fellow who did the BIM, but this is in Le Grand Palais in Paris. And again, Given that that's a person, this is not something that Anish Kapoor decided to do that in a day. This is a whole, you can walk inside, it's called Leviathan. So the thing, the chapters that no one will notice until I tell you, okay? So there is a title, followed always by a phrase, followed by a sentence. So in the phrase, there is no verb, in the sentence, is a verb. And probably no one will notice this, but it's the kind of things in design that you probably notice certain kind of harmony. And at the end, it kind of unconsciously dawns on you that this is tightly constructed. The other thing that we did was we decided to put side notes. This makes things complicated because the real estate for the side note is what you see here. So if I increase the font size of the side notes that they have to be in this page, at some point I make it out of the page and that cannot happen. There are two types of side notes. If it's more than a hundred words, it's in bold italics you want to signify importance. And if it's not, it's Roman, Roman type base. Now, this makes it more complicated than if I put footnotes. Obviously, at the end, you can put any end notes as you see fit, no problem. You can just squeeze all of them there. Even if you are putting them at the bottom of the page, uh, there are books that, for example, the, the, the footnotes are almost as important as the text. Uh, the books by Freud are in that category. But in here, they don't have the luxury because if you put them at the bottom of the page, the dividing line can be anywhere. In here, you have only this. And one thing that you will not notice also is this. This is the index of the book. Okay, And we have we have a choice. It can be only two pages or four pages. Okay? It cannot can be 23 pages. Okay? And if, if we decided that 
four columns, two pages. It's interesting to see the, the, the beginning of the words in indexes on books because it captures the book. And here you have Marina Abramovich, famous woman artist. Charles Babbage, the guy who invented basically computers. John Cage, Leonardo da Vinci, Falling Water, Iconic Chairs, Habits of Creative People, Just Metaphor. But I'm showing you for one reason. You do an index, however long it is, that's it. In here is exactly two pages. There is no blank space in there. Obviously, you have to make decisions of what was not worth to include in the index, but we wanted this to be just exactly that. Now, I mentioned in the past that you have this nexus of thinking requires you to deal with conflicting views. And the idea of conflicting views is something that has been with us for a long time, and I will explain uh, what historical present we have for that, but is one thing in which we squeeze there when we were explaining complexity. And the difference between complicated and complex, which uh, many of you may have heard me talk about, and complicated being systems that are, uh, well, you can barely see it, but there's a, a clock there, and this is full of fish on the right side. So I don't have to explain any of this here. OK, the complicated systems is a blueprint. They are engineered. Every part fulfills a function. The function will not decide, oh, I have to become something else just to make the whole system work. Complex systems are adaptable. They can learn. Well, the stem cells will be a case in which they depend on context. And they will display emergence, which is what sometimes you have to explain this. And I would say, parenthetically, a training in complex systems is probably the best training that you can have if you want to run a school. I, I will go as far as say that the very definition of a leader is to be the person that provides conditions for successful emergence. You want things to emerge bottom up, but you have to work on those conditions. But I also have this in here, and I will explain this is emergence, that things that are in the view of many people opposite to each other can coexist, that you can have chaos and order coexisting. And by the same token, that organization can emerge without central control. And that's managers don't get that. It's about specifying everything. And you, of course, you have to have plans, but you also have to have the ability to produce this successful emergence that results in creative uh, organizations or even creative cities or uh, over time there have been places in which things the an outburst of creativity that you cannot explain by looking at the past so but of course the idea of two opposing things coexisting or having to rationalize comes from quantum physics the typical example would be light is one thing until it encounters something which maybe is better to describe as a particle, but maybe when it travels is more wave like. But it's actually one thing. It depends on how you want to examine it. And so the idea of training yourself to rationalize conflicting viewpoints, I would say, is an essential characteristic of leader because very few things are kind of black, 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 or white, white, white. There are many shades of gray in this. So comparing the structures of our technology and science, what, there is one chapter in which there is art, technology, and science, and it's kind of ordered like this. And then you pick 
uh, something like value of things or who who decides uh, what's worth keeping in the canon of art, technology, and science. And it's very different. And in science, it's journal editors and a whole bunch of things. In art, it's a conference of curators, collectors, museum directors, critics, a whole bunch of things. That, and the, the book contains many, many of these uh, comparisons across and draws conclusions. And out of those things, you may extract lessons that cross domains. Uh, lessons that can be exemplified by looking at either art, technology, and science, but they carry on to the other two domains. So the ones that I'm going to have in here are lessons from art, and I'll just get into one or two. We get into maybe eight. So I'll show you these. Many of you have seen these. These are lithographs made by Picasso. And this is the last one of, they, they were 11 in, in the original series. I think I'm showing eight in here. And unless you are looking attentively at the dates, um, what you'll realize is that this was the first, and this one was the last. And the lesson in here is this. It's, it's, it's an amazingly important lesson in my view. Uh, out of a world or things that have many, many components, extracting the central idea, I would say that's the essence of theory. You capturing one thing, something that contains the wealth of possibilities, but if you understand that, they can derive consequences. But sometimes you have one concept, and this concept can bifurcate in so many possibilities. I mean, not in the wildest dreams, people who invented the transistor would have imagined what bifurcations it would have. Or Watson and Crick, after they unravel what the structure of the DNA was, I think the last sentence in the paper is, it has not escaped our attention that the structure so proposed can have interest in biological. But, uh, it's they, not even the wildest dreams, but there are people who are good doing this and people who are good doing that. Okay? Uh, in fact, people who are in technology who are proposing an idea for a new kind of company or something, they probably have that in mind. It basically encapsulates the dreams that they have about it. So they've been able to see simplicity and complexity, and complexity and simplicity, and seeing both at the same time is, in my view, an important. So there is going one direction or the other one. Another lesson, and I think this is, so these are five sketches of Matisse, preparation for something that became this La Dance. This is in St. Petersburg. Uh, there is actually another version at the MoMA in New York. And Matisse was one of the giants of the 20th century with Picasso in art. But, and he had a long career, painting on his 90s. But sometimes he go to the studio, not exactly clear what he wanted to do, and maybe this painting was there, laying against the wall, and he painted paint. And in here, the same thing. Sometimes he painted his assistant, because she was there. Okay? So what's the lesson in here? The lesson is inspiration is overrated. We tend to think of artists as people who produce, and they are mythology, okay? You know, how the Beatles compose something, fine, uh, but most rarely is a result of a lot, a lot of sweating and being constantly at it. Picasso said it best, uh, and translated from Spanish will be, the inspiration exists, but it has to find you working. 
The final lesson is this, again, Picasso. This is also at the MoMA. Uh, this is sculpture, Baboon and Young. It's actually composed of all objects that they were lying in Picasso's studios. In there, you see clearly the, the, the ears of the baboon are handles of pictures. The face is two toy cars, OK? Uh, pots and pans. So what's the lesson in here? The lesson is that once you see the whole in something really good, the individual pieces disappear. Okay? Uh, the bad artist copy, great artist still, uh, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good encapsulation of this. Uh, copying will mean recreating the whole thing, but this is kind of every technology is a composition of pieces. Now, there are, people ask examples of the intersection of art, technology, and science. One example that we give is George Lucas. Uh, there are entire companies in light, sound, imaging, technology. Is the, the science part, the technology part, and the artistic part, the, all the mythology. This is one perfect example of the intersection of art, technology, and science. So finally, the whole point of the book, in my view, is this. Though we, we go through the world looking at things with one pair of glasses, often very successfully. And but if you work at it, and you try to augment your space, widening your space, your vision, with another pair of glasses. First of all, the world will look much more interesting, but you will have a much broader creative. So that's basically run down on the contents of the book and the ideas that went behind the book. And when we were trying to decide who could, in the website of the book, is uh, the, the machinery of marketing is all Bruce Mao. I have by myself in here with maybe occasionally Kyle in there helping me. Uh, we wanted to have a set of people who would say good things about the book, and we wanted a set of people who are almost mutually orthogonal. So, um, so we, we asked Daniel Pink, who is a best-selling author, actually, Northwestern alum. We asked the person who runs SpaceX, also an alum, Wayne Shotwell. Then the fellow who accepted the Nobel Prize for Doctors Without Borders in there. And uh, this one came because of Bruce, the chief curator and designer from the Museum of Modern Art. And finally, the fellow who among his minor companies is Moderna, the most successful inventor in the United States. So that's all that I have to say, and now I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. So yeah, we have time for questions, both locally uh, and over Zoom. Um, if you have a question, just raise your hand. We'll pass the microphone to you. Thank you for that uh, great presentation. So it, it seems clear, based on your description of the process, that to this book to you is more than just an informational uh, uh, media, but rather a work of art itself. Uh, so as, as art, it inspires emotion as one goes through it and subconsciously or consciously sees the, uh, the symmetry. Um, but there is great information in here. So my question to you is, uh, uh, you know, if you had to choose <laughs> which uh, the reader would get, uh, obviously the message is choose both, but uh, do, you, do you think it's a, more of an experience or more of, a, of, a, of an educational learning? Uh, both. I mean, there are people who, I mean, there's someone who said that the book was poorly designed. She couldn't read it. Uh, it's too small. Um, 
but there are other people who kind of said that the book is auto-referential in the sense that the book encapsulates what it tries to portray, this unity. But there is content, uh, lots of stories. Uh, there is one in here that I have, is in one of the posters in there that you can grab. Yeah. Uh, we talk about moments in which art, technology, and science converge in some parts of the world. And one great story, this will take me two minutes to explain, was a Renaissance floor. And the story had to do with Galileo and they use for what they were called optical tubes. So optical tubes, now everybody will call them a telescope. Okay? Optical tubes, actually, they were sold as something that armies should have to see advancing ships in the horizon, but not to look at the skies. Why not? Because Aristotle had settled that the skies were immutable, nothing will ever change, no one bothered. Even looking at the moon, the moon was supposed to be perfect. Here you can say, I see spots. Well, there were lots of theories. It's very complicated. But Galileo was in Florence and Padua, Florence, more. And in Florence, there was something called L'Accademia del Disegno. So every aspiring artist will go through sculptures, architects will go through training, and they had to draw things. The basis of perspective were all invented there earlier than that. Filippo uh, Brunelleschi created it. So Galileo was very conversant with that. Almost at the same time that Galileo was looking at the skies, for example, he's the guy who discovered that Jupiter had moons. Okay? But before that, they decided to look at the moon itself. And there was this other fellow, Thomas Harriot, but Harriot was in London, and in London, London was no Florence. It was not this zeitgeist of knowledge in there. And when they both drew what they saw, Galileo was an accomplished artist, I can tell. He drew watercolors there. And Harriot had in front of him the very same image. He drew this, he stopped. Galileo could see the shadows, and he could calculate even the height of the craters in the moon. So there you have technology with the optical tubes used in a different way. Science, because the perspective had basis in science, the shadows, the height of the craters, but finally the influence of the place, this emergence of creativity in flow. So yeah, we have lots of places where you can pick one thing. It's not a book that should or must be read in order. You can go chapter five and read it, and it will make sense. Yeah. Thanks for the great presentation, Julio. I want to ask you a question that is likely not covered in the book, so it's not going to be a spoiler if you answer. When you think about uh, prehistorical humans, in, they seem to have independently developed, uh, even if rudimentary, aspects of science and technology in different parts of the world. And it's not difficult to imagine why that would be the case. But, well, they are exposed to certain things. It's natural that they would try to understand astronomy. It's natural that they would develop tools, technological tools that would be of uh, service to them. Uh, but they also developed art, uh, different forms of art, mm -hmm. of the, different places. And it's less obvious uh, a priori what the objective function driving that would have been. Uh, and uh, of course, I would think that there is even a relation to technology. Yet. So I wonder whether you could comment on that. Well, art, you can see before we got to did all the things that happened in Asia, China, India, all the things that happened in the West and Mesoamerica, 
they were completely different. The, uh, I mean, most of them try to even recreate human forms, but even those look completely different. In some cases, we are not allowed to recreate human forms. It, astronomy is probably one case in which different civilizations extracted the same knowledge, not all at the same rate. I mean, starting with the Babylonians, noticing these regularities. Uh, but math is another case uh, in which uh, things advance sometimes much faster. I mean, algebra is basically an Arab invention. Uh, but at some point, some things happen on the conference between physics and math that uh, somehow those took much more shape in some parts of the West. But I, I would say uh, the, the, the basic science that is there to be discovered, most people would have discovered that not in the same way, but they would have discovered because science is about lifting a veil and revealing how something works. It's not about inventing something, although you, you could argue even with math that you could split mathematicians in Platonists and Aristotelians, I would say. Is math invented or discovered? Okay. So, but I do not know if there were other parts of, hopefully at some point we'll know if there are other civilizations out there, if they have similar kind of math as we have. I mean, um, as long as dealing with Euclidean geometry, Pythagoras theorem will be discovered here or somewhere else at the same time. But it's, it's a subject in which you can talk forever about these things. And I, I, I would love when questions like this emerge from readers which are not physicists like yourself, but people who, they, they probably thought, I never thought about this. Maybe this is something worth thinking about. I, the goal of the book will be to incite questions. So yeah, you have. I mean, this is all very fascinating, and I, I think we have been having conversations about many of these things for two decades, and, and, and the, the intersection of all of these and the different evolutionary paths of these different aspects of human culture and creativity. And, uh, and I, I, I hadn't actually heard you say this thing before I don't rem or I don't remember it and I don't remember the exact words because I never remember the exact word but I really liked what you said about that change is not progress and, and use some other word right that there is a difference between progress progress progression is not progress progression and, and no. progress are not the With same technology and, no and, the, and, and I think that's a fascinating aspect of things and it also relates to this thing of art and I've recently been reading some books that have actually brought into me another aspect of human culture that, in a sense, is missing in those three, which is political and social organization, right? Yeah, well, you, you could, uh, some people have asked me, how about religion? Uh, yeah, this, so, um, yeah, the organization of political organizations and the structure that they have, I mean, that's a human achievement. And should be there in some way. And, and, but I don't get into that. Yeah. But I think for all of us to think is a fascinating aspect. Mm -hmm. And I think you are establishing a framework here about thinking about those things. I mean, I mean um, David Graber just with a colleague recently published The Dawn of Everything, which was very eye opening because essentially he was presenting political organization as sort of like art. Yeah. Right? Well, in the sense uh, that you I, have these things that it, it's like, are you talking about progression or progress? Yeah. And, and, and it's fascinating. I quote, I quote one person. I'll say what the name is, but I could ask everybody yes and no one. That 
the way that an organization is structured is probably the most important thing of all, or the most creative thing of all. Who said this? Steve Jobs. Even though he was a control freak, of course. Mm -hmm. but, but, uh, but I think this is, this is the aspect, right? And, and are we thinking about organization and what it enables, right? Because I think one of the things about art, and, and this appears in many contexts, for instance, how do we value particular skills, right? And how do we support particular skills? It, as you said, it's fascinating that in Florence, in spite of everything, there was all this value to artistic uh, creation, which didn't exist in London, right? That there was that they they were kind of developing other things. The Royal Society was about to be created; if it had not been created yet, there was so much. But it's like these other aspects that didn't enrich what else they were doing, and 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 so. When we talk about how to distribute value more broadly to things, and I think we are thinking about also kind of organization and structure, and how do we enable different voices to talk? So it, it's, you know, as usually this, a great talk brings many more questions. So it, 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 it's really fascinating uh, how, uh, all of this stuff is connected. Yeah, it's, I, I try to put, we try to put back as much content as we put, given the limitations of the space. But we get into, we, we tend to think that at some point, scientific journals emerge and all people in science were happy. No, there were many people opposed it completely. One guy was fired as president of the Royal Society. There is a book, by the, by the way, just appeared, a scientific journal. He was fired because he favored the creation of journal. This is before the proceedings of the Royal Society emerged. So I, I think the idea that there's always more than meets the eye is, is always important. That things are never as clean as. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so who had? Yeah. So I just want to also emphasize it's just truly fascinating. And that we talked about your book a couple of times, and it's really, really interesting to see everything coming together and of course just thank you Wait, for Dashun this. and Adilson are part of the book. Lewis is in the acknowledge. They are, they are, I hope they are not biased. <laughs> no, it's just it's eye opening for me too just to look at a whole holistic picture. You know, I just keep thinking about this nexus of arts, technology and science. And uh, it, a name keep coming by, uh, like Leonardo da Vinci, who is probably the most famous one to transcend all these three domains with ease. There were other ones. Yeah. Uh, Leon Battista Alberti, we see that Leonardo was probably, probably even more so. I see. Yeah. So then we're also looking at today's scientists, and our own work suggests that what happens in science over the past century is this very clear growing specialization uh, for the knowledge, et cetera. So what we're seeing is that, you know, today's scientists has actually become more and more isolated and specialized. And that's where I think what we do at NICO and, and Northwest and O'Browley is to facilitate interdisciplinary thinking. But now with Nexus, you're taking this to another level. As I say, not interdisciplinary within science, but there are great lessons to be learned from other domains. Right. So now I think about that and considering the many challenges already of doing interdisciplinary research within science, how do we nurture the next generation of scientists if we were to believe that you know, so there is great lessons to be learned outside of science? And I do see there is a greater convergence uh, I just came back actually this weekend from uh, a Lazaro Barbashi's exhibit uh, in New York City, also about thinking about how do we combine arts and science. So, so I wonder how, 
how you are thinking about how do we train or nurture scientists now of embracing Nexus so we can all benefit more from arts and technology, especially things outside of science. So, I mean, you, you can talk about this for an hour, but I just give you my encapsulated. Yeah. Sometimes it's important to show people what's possible. Yeah, I mean, you came from abroad as a PhD student. You never, especially in, there are many places in which you are nurtured to death. Death in math and physics never took force outside there. And somehow your eyes get open that, wow, this is something that some people can do. But you, what you have to have within you is something that is the hardest thing to teach. You cannot teach. I think I can teach people how to be more creative in some sense. It's very hard to teach people how to be curious. So if you are curious, you have that, and you go to a place and you show, you know, there are people who manage to do this, and the opportunity is this. The, in the future, the people who can translate domains, you don't need, because a lot of, uh, we didn't talk about this, but this applies to individuals, but also teams. You don't need everybody in the team to be a nexus thinker. You just need enough to produce the connectivity there. And some people will react to this, and I can see that with students, uh, that somehow, even beginning faculty, that, wow, I had no idea this was possible. Thanks again for an exciting talk. I was curious, you had pointed out the difference between people's prejudices of great, great minds in art versus great minds in science. One of the things that um, I think a lot of people would associate, I wanted to get to the point of determinism, a lot of people would think that if there's a discovery that's made in science, it's because it was time for that discovery to be made. If it wasn't made by Einstein, or if it wasn't made by Newton, or if it wasn't made by Marconi, somebody else would have done it. Yeah. But in the fields of creativity, oh, well, that's Picasso. No, like that was genuinely Picasso. No one else could have been it. And so there's a, people tend to ascribe determinism to, pro, to progress in science, uh, but they assign creativity to individuality. I was just curious your perspective. I, 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 I get into that. So they were a famous person who argued that the the creativity displayed by Homer, before we discovered that Homer actually composed it, okay, was higher than Newton, was Immanuel Kant, one of the most known in century. In uh, because in the case of Homer, the thing appeared. Whereas in Newton, he thought, and this was a bad example, you could recreate the steps whereby Newton had covered what was. The example was thought. Right? But yeah, in many respects, uh, there are things in there waiting to be discovered. As soon as you, someone discovered Thomson, the electron, and and the neutron and proton, they were probably people thinking, well, what more is in there? And you go and excavate and you cut. But there are things that, the example of math, eh, more or less like poetry, eh, how on earth someone decided to invent something like categorization of It's not like someone had to do that. So I don't buy for a moment that the creativity displayed in art is at a higher level than design. Yeah. First, I, I know this has been said so many times already, but thank you for such an outstanding and informative presentation that was presented so concisely. And so I wanted to ask about 
you said that one of the purposes of the book was uh, to uh, mastering complexity. And I wanted to ask about a quote that I think appears in the book or one of the posters. It was, learn a craft and set it aside. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, is, uh, as if you were making a recommendation for learners of the present and researchers of the future, do you, would you recommend that each individual masters a certain craft, dedicates themselves, commits themselves to one thing and go as far as they can with it or try to find the intersection between everything? Because now we're in a, we live in a society where there's too much information and spreading yourself too thin is very easily a possibility. So, so the master, Martin, the craft can set it up. So, I mean, depends on the example. So, for example, if you could paint like Cezanne now, that will not make you a great artist. That's done. Okay? On the other hand, there are things in which you have to know enough in such a way that you can decide what questions to attack but not so much that you can start second guessing yourself, well, someone might have done this, and that your work is an extension of someone else's extension. Okay? Most of the work that people do are extensions of what other people have done. You add one more layer in the knowledge base of physics, for example. But once in a while, there is someone who, due to timing, lack, uh, is at the inception of a new idea, and that's when whatever you have learned in the past, you, you have to throw out because it just doesn't help. I mean, I, at the beginning of quantum mechanics was probably such a case. I mean, you, that's why the myth of the, you're not young, you have discovered something by 35, that's when the age of Nobel prizes dropped down because it was a w new way of thinking and whatever you had with you from the past didn't help you to make the transition to this. So, but in most things you have to know some basis before you move into something that has your stamp. And this, this would apply to architecture, a whole bunch of things. Which, by the way, let me just leave you with this thought, because this is the... To what extent AI would discover something new? My view is, in the way that things are now, no. And let me give you one example which is trivial, okay? Uh, and it's not feeding all knowledge of physics prior to 1900, and somehow the ideas of quantum mechanics existed, much more pedestrian than this. Let's imagine that you are an architect. In 1970, you are designing big buildings like the Thompson Center or skyscrapers, and you want ideas for a new building. You, you have all of that stored, and you can, you can maybe play with design constraints, OK? percentage of windows that you want, columns, you will never ever discover what a fellow named George Portman did after 1970. That is, when we put the elevators outside the building and make them a design feature of the space, or open the atrium and make the elevators visible in there, because every building before that, they were inside. So the question is, how do you put into something, the ability to break assumption, which is what we are talking about with learn the craft and then set it aside, is the ability of breaking an assumption. And this is what I call break with rather than breakthroughs, because a breakthrough kind of implies there is a set and you pierce through the domain of the set and you add a new component. But break with is probably another class because what this implies is that to add this new piece of knowledge, you probably have to abandon, break with all the implicit assumptions they were controlling the field before. And that's very hard to 
I'm talking with people who actually know something about AI, but that's my gut feeling. But it's part of the answer to that question. So we're running a bit late, but if anyone has one last dying question before we break. Anything from Zoom, Andy? Okay. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. With us. Awesome, thanks for coming and uh, don't forget to grab lunch and uh, next week, Wednesday at noon. <laughs>